able men go forth to battle to sweat out the last days of the shooting war in Korea. Trucks rumble slowly to the front where red guns mercilessly thunder death. The raking fire of machine guns splatters the enemy. And grim GIs dodge and duck the communist shot and shell as they scramble across the scarred hills on dangerous patrol missions. This is the dirty, foul fighting as UN soldiers have noted in Korea for three years, one month, and two days. The smell of death, which has snuffed out 25,000 American lives in the war, bursts over their bodies as they hug the earth, waiting, praying for the armistice that will silence the communist guns. Halfway around the world, at the Marine base at Quantico, Virginia, Secretary of Defense Charles E. Wilson arrives for an extraordinary three-day meeting of high military and government officials on America's defense and security problems. During the conference, the top brass reportedly hears Wilson outline top secret Defense Department plans in the event of a Korean truce. President Eisenhower motors from Washington to take an active role in the conference, which has for its theme, defense progress, a team responsibility. Ike's cabinet is on hand as he and General Cates, Quantico Commandant, step forward to review a regiment of Leathernecks. The Marines take the salute of their Commander-in-Chief. Later, the golf course beckons, and America's most famous divot digger tees up and belts a long one straight down the middle. In the anxious hours before an armistice, President Eisenhower lays aside briefly the cares of state, while in Korea, communist laborers are working on a peace pagoda in the dusty truce village of Panmunjom. The Reds blend crude equipment and the age-old building techniques with the advantages of a captured American bulldozer to complete the new building where the ceremonial of signing an armistice will take place. Not far away, communist negotiators, led by their stony-faced senior delegate Naomiel, reach the end of the long and torturous journey toward a truce. Two years and 17 days after the first meeting at Panmunjom, both sides are ready to sign the armistice agreement as General Harrison leaves the final session. Meanwhile, the Swiss and Swedish members of the commission, which will supervise the armistice, now only hours away, set up headquarters at nearby Monsan. Massive problems lie ahead as they prepare to take up their difficult task for the United Nations. And to the Quantico Chapel, President Eisenhower comes to offer prayers and thanksgiving that the fighting will soon be ended in the divided and war-ravaged Korean Peninsula. The simple service ended, he prepares to return to Washington to await the dramatic announcement that the long-awaited armistice has been signed at Panmunjom. Later, at his White House desk, the President, discussing the truce, warns Americans not to relax their vigilance. We have won an armistice on a single battleground, not peace in the world. We may not now relax our guard nor cease our quest. Throughout the coming months, during the period of prisoner screening and exchange, and during the possibly longer period of the political conference, which looks toward the unification of Korea, we and our United Nation allies must be vigilant against the possibility of untoward developments. And as we do so, we shall fervently strive to ensure that this armistice will, in fact, bring free peoples one step nearer to their goal of a world at peace. <laughs>